looked at Ruth chapter 1, Ruth chapter 2. We've made our way now to Ruth chapter 3. And uh, tonight, if you're taking note, the title to the message, and really as we move through the book of Ruth, it plays out this way. The title is The Rest. The Rest. And I'm not talking about the rest of the story. I'm talking about real rest. Real rest. Can you guys say real rest? Can you say real rest? Come on, guys, one more time. Can you say real rest? You're going you're gonna to come alive tonight, I'm telling you. It's going to happen. Um, and as we look at this, we're seeing this life of Ruth. We're seeing what she has to, you know, this, this Moabitess who was called of God, that the Lord is calling her into his family. And guys, we're going to see this rest. And if you're taking note, you could jot this down. It, it's in verse 18. It's the last verse. But you're going to see this phrase. Naomi's going to say it to Ruth. She's going to say, sit still. Sit still. I certainly believe that there are many here tonight that need to hear that from the Lord. Sit still. This, uh, this past week, um, I was with my daughter, and I was kind of looking at something on my cell phone, and it was a video, and I showed it to her. It was a video of a Brazilian man. He was riding a wave, and the wave was so huge that it looked like a little speck on a small wave. But as you watch this video, what you discovered was it wasn't a little speck, it was a man. And he was on this gigantic wave. It was huge. It was massive. Honestly, if I was him, it would have scared the life out of me. But for this man, he was riding it, he was at rest in it, and it was moving him. And, you know, kind of as we look at Root chapter 3 tonight, listen, I think that's a perfect picture of, of God. He's more powerful than you and I could ever imagine. You cannot control him. When man tries to tell the wave what to do, have you ever tried to tell a wave what to do? It crashes over him. It knocks him over. The only thing you could do is what? Ride it for you surfers of New York, right? All you can do is ride the wave. You have to, you have to ride the Lord. You've got to stay with him. You've got to move with him. And Ruth is a really a perfect picture of that. And tonight, that's what we're going to look at here in Ruth chapter 3. Listen, if you've been with us, the spiritual message of this book is God's providence for those who trust Him. God's providence. You know, tonight, you're not here by accident. Where you're at in life tonight, it's not by accident, right? Where you're at in your family tonight, it's not by accident. God is providential. And we're seeing that in the book of Ruth. Last week, we saw in chapter 2, you know, they thought that Ruth had just by so happened to be in the field of Boaz, her redeemer. There's no just so happen in the kingdom. There's no just so happen. You know, that person you just so happened to run in today, you didn't just so happen to run into them, right? That situation didn't just so happen. God is providentially moving. And the reason why, guys, listen, if you're taking note, the word that appears more than any other in the book of Ruth is the word redeem. It's redeem, redemption, redeeming. Listen, God wants to buy us back. God wants to buy us back. The overarching picture of the book of Ruth is that of the body of Christ in Jesus. You know, Ruth represents the believer, you, me, the child of God, the one who was once lost. We were a Moabitess, right? We were a slave of sin. But then our Redeemer came to save us. That's Jesus. He wants to save you. He wants to save me. And this redemption is so important. But as we move through this, We've kind of seen the picture of how this plays out. And I think many of us, probably you can relate. You know, chapter one, if you're taking note, in chapter one, we saw the decision. The decision. There was some bad decisions in Ruth chapter one, and there was some good decisions. The bad decisions, well, it was Naomi and her husband. There was a famine in Israel. And they chose, rather than to wait on the Lord to stay the course, they chose to go to the enemy's camp to do things their own way. And we talked about this. There was one famine and there were three funerals. Three funerals. You know, God loves us and he cares for us, but our decisions matter. How we make decisions matters. And we talked about that in chapter one. But in contrast to Naomi and her husband's poor decision was this Gentile Ruth's wonderful decision. She saw even in Naomi, and we talked about this, a backslidden picture of this, this saint, 
but she, she still saw the life of the Lord in her. And Ruth saw that even, even in a backslidden picture, even in somebody who wasn't really trusting the Lord, she still saw it was better to be in the tents of God than to be in the best places of the wicked. It's better. And Ruth made a good decision to go and to seek the Lord. And then in chapter 2, we looked at this last week. Chapter 1 was the decision. Chapter 2 was the labor. You know, I think this is where sometimes we get off. Right? God, we make a good decision. We say yes to Jesus. We begin to follow him. But then sometimes we don't realize, listen, we have to labor at the things that God tells us to do. Right? You know, how many of you guys, how many of you guys have your own Bible? Your own Bible. Right? If you don't, you can keep the Bible in your hand. I want you to have your own Bible. But the amazing thing about the Bible is it makes a good, like, uh, you know, weight on your desk, right? It keeps papers from going away. If you are without a pillow, you could put it down. And if your Bible's thick enough, it's soft. But that's not what the Bible's for, right? Right? The Bible, you actually have to dig into it for yourself, don't you? There's a labor there. How about prayer? We've been talking about prayer here at the church. This month, we're focusing on prayer. Prayer is something, listen, the first time I remember going to pray, I was kind of like, oh, this is interesting, you know. You, you're like, Lord, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen next. And you're trying to develop this relationship with God through prayer. And sometimes it could be a labor. You know, Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. That could be laborious. You want to pray the opposite, right? Lord, get them. The Lord says, no. In Ruth, we saw she did the things that God, that God had told her to do. She went to the fields. She gleaned in the fields. And we looked at that last week. And now tonight, we're going to see that good decision, the labor at the things God called her to labor at. Tonight, we're going to see the rest that results from these things. The rest that comes from obeying God. Doesn't that sound good? How many of you guys want to come to a place where you experience the rest of God because you've made good decisions and you've labored at the things that God called you to. I know I do, right? I certainly do. I hope you do. And it's, it's what God's word teaches us. So tonight, we're going to pick it up. Ruth chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. And it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Verse 2. Naomi says, now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative or is he not our kinsman, if you have a King James Version Bible? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now stop there for a moment. If you remember back in chapter 2, listen, Naomi was bitter. Naomi knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She grew up a Jewish woman, but she had grown bitter through the circumstances of life. And listen, honestly, I understand. Her husband died. Her two sons died. You know, things didn't go the way she really thought they were going to go. But she had grown bitter. But this young believer, this woman, Ruth, her obedience to the Lord actually, and we talked about this last week in chapter 2, we saw there that Naomi began to praise the Lord as she saw God working in Ruth's life. You know, that's your and my opportunity and now we see almost a new Naomi, right? That's the beautiful thing. Listen, maybe your walk with the Lord has gotten filled with all kinds of carnal things, right? Often people say, man, I feel far from God. But really the truth of the matter is this. God is not any closer to you or any farther away than the day you were saved. He's still there. What happens is, what happens is our lives get filled with all this stuff. A lot of which is, honestly, junk. Would you not agree, you know? Most of the stuff this world has to offer, you know, at the beginning, it's like, oh, wow, this is shiny. And then you take the wrapper off, and it's, it's no good. There's nothing there. There's no there there, right? That's what happens. For Naomi, this is what happened. She got so focused on the bread <laughs> that wasn't in Bethlehem that she went to the world. And it resulted in consequence for her. But now we have a new Naomi. A new Naomi. And maybe you're here. Maybe you want to experience newness in your life. Listen, Naomi says to Ruth, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you? And if you're taking notice, the first principle we're going to see here tonight in terms of 
the rest of God being still, number one, is you need to prepare to meet your Redeemer. You know, you need to prepare. There needs to be some preparation that goes into this walk. You know, I'm sure you've heard this, but if not, it's a great little quote. It's success is when preparation meets opportunity. Success is when preparation meets opportunity. You know, for a Christian, you know, God could want to use you. There could be an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and even be used of God to lead someone to Christ. But success is when preparation meets opportunity, right? Maybe they come across us and I've had this happen before. You know, thank God for my wife, Rachel, who kind of elbows me and says, share the gospel with them. You know, I remember years back, we were on a plane actually leaving Florida, coming to New York. And there was this guy that sat down on the plane next to me and I had my Bible open and you could just tell he wanted to talk to me about the Bible. And I could tell, my wife could tell, he wasn't trying to hide it, but I was tired. I didn't feel like it. I'm, that was a pastor. I still, it doesn't matter. You know, you still have a flesh and a spirit. And I was reading my Bible so I could get in the spirit, but he, he was too early, right? You know, it was before I was kind of getting back into a good mood, so to say. But I remember he got up to use the restroom or whatever they call them on a uh, plane, you know, the little cubicle box. And um, Rachel looks at me and says, are you kidding me? You know, she didn't say it just like this. I'm giving you my paraphrase. She basically said, this guy, he's begging you to tell him about Jesus. And even when he came back, I still wasn't totally sold. But eventually we got to talking about the things of the Lord. And, you know, it was awesome. Got to lead him to Christ right on a JetBlue airline. You know, we turned the TVs off. It was shocking. I know, it's a big move. A big sacrifice for me spiritually. But guys, listen, success is when preparation meets opportunity, right? We see that. And for, for Naomi here, she says to Ruth, shall I not seek security? Or if you're taking note, you could write in the margin, shall I not seek rest for you? Naomi's heart had totally changed. You know, that's often the case with a backslidden believer or a carnal Christian. All the ingredients are there for a delicious, beautiful representation of Christ. But the problem is when they don't get cooked properly or when we get filled with our own ways, you know, the Bible says the backslider in heart is filled with their own ways. But it's amazing how quickly that fire can be reignited. And for Naomi, she goes from all about Naomi, bitterness for Naomi, to now she's thinking about Ruth. She's, she's thinking about this, this daughter the Lord's given her. And now how can I be a blessing to her? It's amazing. And she says, I want rest. Uh, if you're taking note, you could jot it down. Four times in this chapter, we'll see Ruth at rest at the feet of the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer, Boaz. But four times, you'll see where Ruth finds her rest, where that comes from. This word rest is the Hebrew word M-A-N-O-W-A-C-H, manowak, and it means a resting place or coming to rest. Doesn't that sound wonderful? chaotic world, busyness. The Lord wants to give you and I a real rest. And Naomi tells Ruth there in verse two, it says, he is winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor. Guys, listen, this is the end of the harvest. Okay, this is the end of the harvest. Remember, Ruth was out in the fields gleaning the grain. And what they do is they share a threshing floor with the community. So all these different farmers, they wouldn't have their own threshing floor. They'd share it. And that means, you know, Boaz wasn't there every night. He had a specific time he was going to be there. What that tells me is Naomi was in, involved in this little romantic coming together type of thing. Naomi, I don't know if she went on Google, but somehow she found out when Boaz was going to be there. And she was engaged in this thing, guys. She was involved in it. And she told Ruth, she says, he's going to be there tonight. He's going to be there tonight. You got to get ready. And it's interesting how this thing plays out. Let's move on. Verse 3. Naomi now says to Ruth, therefore, wash yourself. If you have your pen, underline that. Wash yourself. And anoint yourself. Underline that one. And put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. It doesn't seem like something you'd get prepared for. To go to the, I'm going to get ready for the threshing floor. You know, for this place of trial, this place of brokenness, this place where wheat is separated from chaff, right? But Naomi says, get ready for it. 
But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Always a good idea, ladies. Wait till his belly is full, right? You know, it's a, the only time I'm, well, on a plane and before I eat. Those are the times I'm a little grumpy. But look what he says here. Wash yourself. Wash yourself. You know, if you're single folk here tonight and you want to see God bless you with that special someone, listen, this is a good preparation. Wash yourself. Now, listen, I'm not talking about the basics here, but that goes without saying, or maybe not, but it's a good idea, right? But spiritually, what is it? Ephesians 5, Paul tells us we are washed by the water of God's word. You know, you want to be refreshed. You want to be ready. Wash in the word, man. Get this book, open it up, read it, and let it wash over your life. It cleanses you. It cleanses me. It cleanses us. You know, you want to stay clean? Keep in the Word. Um, now, I haven't been in a science lab for a long time, but I remember they have these, these, these eye wash stations in a science lab, right? And it's because you're dealing with these chemicals, so you go over there, and you push it, and it shoots this water at your eyes, and it cleanses them out. Listen. We live in a chemistry lab, okay? There are poisons that come through our eye gate every single day. Most of them, we're not choosing. We're not like, send this poison through my eye gate. No, it's forcing itself on you. You know, you drive down the street, there's billboards, all kinds of stuff. You know, not too long ago, I had somebody say, oh, look at this. Put the phone right in my face. I was ready to love them in Jesus' name. That's what I was ready to do. <laughs> But it wasn't an appropriate thing. You know, it wasn't that bad. I'm on tape here, so I don't want to make, oh man, Pastor Bill's falling. No. But what I'm saying is, it, it, it's forced on you. What are you to do? You can either, number one, become a monk and go live in the middle of, you know, India or wherever. Or you can wash yourself with the word of God. And you need it. You need it. She said, wash yourself. Second, she said, what? Anoint yourself. Church, listen, Paul called it the fragrance of Christ. There is, a, there is a distinct spiritual smell, might I say, to this world. Distinct. You know? Oh, man. I have so many stories I could tell about this, but I'm going to keep the message moving here. But there's this distinct spiritual smell to the world, and there's this distinct spiritual smell to somebody who's walking with Christ. Paul called it the fragrance of Christ. He says, to those that are perishing, it's the fragrance of death. You, you know, you think sometimes you wake up in the morning, you read your Bible, you pray, then you get to work, and it's like, why are all these people against me? Because you smell like Jesus, man. You know, you're, you're starting to be changed. And that's when they begin to say, what do you think, you're better than us? You're going, no, I'm not better than you. Of course not. I just know Jesus. I'm forgiven. You know, you try to speak the truth in love. You have to anoint yourself. An anointing is always a, a, a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit. Guys, listen, Jesus didn't speak of the Holy Spirit as a force or some academic to be learned of. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus said you are to ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Daily. Jesus spoke of it in reference to breakfast. Right? Jesus said, I want this to be a part of your daily life. Every day, be filled with the Spirit. There should be life, guys. Listen, church, we should be alive. <laughs> we should be alive. We should be going to our places of employment. We should be going to the restaurants that we frequent here at Calorie Chapel. You know what I mean? We should be going to our supermarkets. We should be in our communities. We should be alive. There should be life in us. But church, listen. You're going, Pastor, why are you beating me up? It's not in you. It's saying, Lord Jesus, would you anoint me with the Holy Spirit this morning? Father, would you fill me with the Spirit? Would you anoint my life? You need that. And then I love what, what she says last. She says, and put on your best garment. Put on your best garment. I want you to catch this. You know, she wanted Ruth to change her garment before she went to her Redeemer. And I want to say this, church, lovingly, but also authoritatively. You have to make a choice to praise God every single day. 
You have to make that choice. You have to make that choice. And you can. Isaiah 61, I love this chapter. Isaiah 61, you could read the whole chapter later on, but Isaiah 61 verse 10, Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. He says, my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Guys, listen, you have everything you need to praise God right now. You have everything you need. I mean, I don't think any one of us here would say, God hasn't blessed me so much more than I deserve. And sometimes I think we miss this. Praising God is a choice that we have to make. I can choose on any given day to be blessed. Any given day, you and I can choose to be blessed if we would, one, wash in the word. Two, ask for the Holy Spirit. And three, choose to praise God that day. Begin to praise him. Begin to thank him. You may not feel like it when you start, but after you get done in the word, getting a good wash, you get done saying, Holy Spirit, fill me. And then you worship, you praise the Lord. I'm telling you, you will have the, the best day of the year. And the beautiful thing about the word is that could be every day. In Ruth Though she was a new Christian, she got this. She got it. And Naomi encouraged her in this. And she said, get ready to meet with Boaz. Back to Ruth chapter 3, verse 4 now. So Ruth is ready to go. Naomi says, then it shall be. This is where it gets a little interesting. We're going to need a little cultural context here. When he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies. Now, some of you older saints, this is not good advice to give to a younger Christian, okay? Let's be clear here. But we'll understand the context in a minute. And you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. Now, this guy was working out in the field. You know, I don't know what those feet really looked like. She must have really liked this guy. And it says, and he will tell you what you should do. Verse 5, and she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. That's Ruth to Naomi. She had a humble heart, Ruth. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. Verse 7. And after Boaz has eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now listen, for Ruth, this was a huge step of faith, church. Don't miss this. This was a huge step of faith to listen, right? To, sometimes it's hard. Maybe there's an authority in our life that asks us to do something. It's a step of faith to listen. It's a step of faith to listen. For, for Ruth with Naomi, this was a step of faith. But she did it. Ruth is spe special, guys. This is kind of in the Bible what separates. You know, you kind of see a Joseph, right, in the Old Testament. I mean, this guy, all he wanted to do was obey his father, right? Do what was right, serve. And in the midst of that, his brothers got jealous, sold him into slavery. He gets there. He's been slow into slavery. Then he gets into a house, Potiphar's house, serves God faithfully there. He's not complaining. He's not talking about it. He's serving faithfully. The Lord blesses him there. Potiphar's wife looks at him and goes, hmm. You know, apparently there was desperate housewives back then too. You know, this is not new. I'm just being honest here. So she looks and goes, ah, what happens? She lies about him. He gets thrown in prison. What happens in prison? God blesses him in prison. God blesses him in prison. Joseph still praises the Lord. And the list really goes on and on. Those that were used of God, they served the Lord. But see, here in verse 4, this is a picture of Christ. This is a picture of how you and I need to relate with him to get down to his feet, to get to the place where the wheat is separated from the chaff. That's where it happens. You know, you want to see your life change. You want to see change happen within you. You need to humble yourself, get down to the feet of Jesus, because that's where the wheat and the chaff is separated in your and my life. 
You know, John the Baptist, used mightily by the Lord, in speaking about Jesus, he said, John the Baptist said that he was not worthy to even loose Jesus' sandals. And he said about Jesus, the winnowing fan is in his hand, meaning Jesus is separating in the lives of his people. He's working in you. He's working in me. And this is where it happens. This is where it happens. It happens in a humble place. You know, I don't know where we get some of these ideas in the body of Christ today. I really don't. You know, and then I turn on maybe the radio and I find out where we get them from, you know. And, and I love all these things and I support it and just love the body of Christ. But, but I want to say something directly here. Uh, the word of God has not changed. It's still the same. And God, it, when you and I humble ourselves before the Lord, God exalts us. His word says he will do that. When you and I puff up in pride, and speak of ourselves and how great we are, God honors his word. He said he opposes the proud. You know, Ruth humbled herself. And you're going to see, God is going to exalt her. It's how it always works, church. Let's move on. Verse 8, so now Ruth, she goes there, she lays down. And now it happened at midnight, verse 8, that the man was startled. Yeah, I bet he was. He's like, what in the world is at my feet right now, right? And he turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. Now, this is pretty strange stuff, you know, even for this time. You're laying there. It's basically all men. They're in the threshing floor. They just got done with a hard night's work. Now, they're all kind of laying down, going to sleep. All of a sudden, it's midnight, and Boaz feels a little rustling at his feet. You know, I got to imagine he was a heavy sleeper. He was a hard worker, right? And all of a sudden, he feels something maybe a little furry down there. <laughs> he's, he's going, what is that? What is that? You know, surprising. It's an interesting situation. But nothing, there's nothing immodest or immoral about this, okay? This is a picture. Her actions were declaring to Boaz that she desired him to be her spiritual covering. She was basically saying, you know what? This is going to be hard for me. But this is what I desire. I'm positioning myself. I'm humbling myself. I'm humbling myself. It's a powerful picture. And this must happen in a very particular way. Because imagine for a moment she had laid down at the wrong guy's feet. You know, Imagine she would have kind of taken matters in her own hands. I'm going to do it my way. Right? I'm not going to listen to the authorities that God's placed in my life. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to listen to Naomi. Well, you know, could have gone pretty bad there. Could have gone pretty bad. But she listened. She lays down. Let's see what happens. Verse 9. And it says, and he said, who are you? I don't know that that was the uh, response that uh, she thought she was going to get. You know, for some of the sisters, you might be, you know, I think this is the one. And you kind of put yourself in a position, and uh, he goes, who are you anyways, you know? And you're like, you don't even know me? That's kind of what happens, or at least that's how it could have been taken if Ruth wouldn't have taken a deep breath. So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative, or you're a kinsman, a kinsman redeemer in those days. She says to him, listen, and if you have your pen, you can underline it. You are a close relative. Listen, you're a kinsman. You're a redeemer. And it's number two, if you're taking note, in terms of the rest or being still. Number two is you need to learn to submit to the Savior. Submit to the Savior. This is a tough thing for us. This is a tough thing, not just for you, not just for me. This is a concept of our culture that the idea of submission has been taught that it also means weakness. It's just not true, you know. It's just not true. You know, if you and I were to leave her today, go sign up for the military, right? And we get into the military, now we're part of the Marines. We go through boot camp, and we're there. We're all ready. We're like, I can't wait for this. And there, our drill sergeant comes out, and I've talked to some of these guys, you know, the, the stuff that they say, I mean, it is some tough stuff. 
and they say, I'm not here to listen to you, well, their time in the military is going to be very short-lived. They're going to do a lot of push-ups and a lot of running. You know, when it comes to real things, when it comes to real things, there has to be order. There's order to things. And for Ruth, she does these things. She goes and she says to, she says to Boaz there in verse 9, please cover me. Cover me. You know, that, that word, if you're taking note, you could jot it down in your notes. It's atonement. You know, that's the picture here. It's, it's a covering. That's what Jesus did for you and I. We come to the Lord and we don't say, Lord, I'm here to offer you all my good works. No, we come to him and we say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Lord, would you cover me? Would you cover me? And, and sometimes we get this idea that we move out of that. We no longer need that. You know what? I used to be a sinner, but now I've been in church a long time. Now I'm not anymore. Now let's move on to bigger and better things. Church, it's, it's a mistake. It's not true. You still need the Lord to cover you, to wash you, to give you an entrance to the Father, to give you an opportunity to go cleanly to Him. And really, guys, listen, Ruth puts herself out here. She says to Boaz, would you cover me? Would you cover me? I believe this is a picture of salvation. You know, the Lord, He's there, He's available, He's powerful, He's big. But you and I have to go to him at some point and say, Lord, would you save me? Lord, would you forgive me of my sins? Listen, the Lord wants to, just like Boaz wants to do this for Ruth. But there has to come a point where in our hearts, between us and God, we say, Lord, will you do this for me? Because I'm a sinner. I'm in need. I'm in need. Would Boaz do it? Will Boaz do it? Let's see what happens next. Verse 10. It says, then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Verse 11, and now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now listen, if you're taking note, it's number three in terms of the rest. Number three is we need to learn to listen to the Lord. Church, we need to learn to listen to the Lord. You know, this is exactly what our, redeem, our Redeemer, our Boaz, says to us. Boaz says, when she comes and says, will you cover me? Will you open up your coat and bring me in? That was the, that was the picture in those days. You wanted to get engaged back then? You had to, the man had to open up his vesture and invite you in. Say, you're going to come under my covering. It's a beautiful picture. But this is the same thing for our Redeemer, our Boaz, when he says to us, when we go to him and say, Lord, would you save us? His arms, they're wide open, aren't they? He's ready to receive. He's ready to bring you in. You know, if you're here tonight, you haven't made a decision for Jesus. I want you to know his arms are open. He's ready to bring you in. And even to go one step further, just like Boaz says, he says, when you came into my field, what did he say? That was a blessing. That was a blessing. You know, when you show up at church to seek the Lord, to take communion, to study his word, you're blessing your heavenly father. It's a blessing to him. He says, oh, there's a people that are still hungry for me. They're still thirsty for me. They want to know me more. You know, when you and I... You know, take time in the morning to seek the Lord. Maybe open our Bibles to pray. It's a blessing to our Heavenly Father. You, are, you delight Him. You bless Him. You're, you're blessing His heart. It's a big deal, guys. And Boaz says, when you came into my field, you blessed me. And now you're blessing me more by wanting me to cover you. And Boaz goes on here to call and say, listen, you're a virtuous woman. You're character has spread it's spread listen this evening if you're living for the lord if you're seeking god you're seeking to have character and grow with jesus people around you are taking notice people around you are taking notice they're hearing about it they're finding out they're, you're in that situation and they're going you know this person's not the same as they used to be 
You, you, you have an opportunity to really bless them. You know, one thing I always tell my children, I say, listen, you know, we're going to open the door. You're going to have a new opportunity to go into this thing. But you're going to have to be a thermostat and not a thermometer, right? A thermostat and not, not a thermometer. And you guys know the difference between the two, right? A thermostat sets the temperature. A thermometer changes to the temperature. Paul said, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we should be. I remember years ago um, reading an article about a football player down in Texas. He was a Christian. He was like the first Tim Tebow before Tim Tebow type of thing. And this guy just had won the state championship. I mean, he was a big shot. He was, you know, on the ESPN rankings for the best quarterbacks going into college. And the press came to him and they said, you know, you're this young man, good looking guy, quarterback of the football team. How do you deal with peer pressure? How do you deal with peer pressure? And he looked into the camera and he said, he says, you know, with all due respect, ma'am, he said, I am peer pressure, he said. Church, that's what the Bible says you and I are to be, right? It's not like, all right, I'm going to, it's, we wash in the word, we're filled with the spirit, we're going with the garment of praise. And I said this to you before, and I'll say it again, listen, you know, often we go into our workplaces or around our family functions, listen, and, and I think as Christians, sometimes we like feel like, I'm going to walk on eggshells because I don't want to be offensive to anyone. Can I give you a little hint? You've already offended them by following Jesus. It's too late. They know. You want to know something else? When you're not around, they talk about you. They do. And it's probably not all good. Oh, now he thinks he's holy. Reading in his Bible, right? Who cares? Go in, in a little secret, I've said it before and I'll say it again, just treat them like they're Christians. Like, don't get all weird about it. Just talk to them about your life. You know, my wife was sharing with me a story. Um, this woman, she uh, was a professor in uh, college and just like head of the lesbian movement and all these crazy things. And this pastor and his wife, they just built a relationship with her, invited her over the house, spent time with her, and they were just light. They were light. And this woman came to be a follower of Jesus. She came to receive the Lord. They were light. They, they didn't bend. They didn't, sit, you know, they didn't turn to her. But they, they stayed the course in this. And there's something to be said, church, about just being light. Loving, light. Being loving, light. And, and that's what we see here uh, with Boaz, with Naomi. And Boaz says to her, he commends her and says, you're a blessing to me that you did not go after these young men. You know, he saw there was virtue in her. They, they weren't just caught by everything new and shiny. You know, one of the titles for the Lord in the book of Daniel, it's called the Ancient of Days. You know, and I think for some Christians today, God's too old for them, you know. They kind of want a new Jesus, a hip Jesus. I don't use the word hip. I just use it just now. It's kind of embarrassing. But anyways, that's what they want. But he doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, church. He won't change. Let's move on. Verse 12. He says, now it is true that I am a close relative, Boaz says. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But he, if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for, for you. As the Lord lives, he says, lie down until morning. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Verse 15, also he said, bring the shawl that is on, on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. So Boaz says, listen, there is a closer relative to you than me. And what I have to do is I have to go to him first. Boaz didn't short circuit the process. Boaz did things the way they were supposed to be done. You know, 
if you're here, you're single, you're waiting on the Lord, or you're going in God's direction, do things the way they're supposed to be done. Don't try to cut corners. Don't. You know, one thing I said back when we were studying uh, the book of Numbers, and every time the children of Israel thought they were taking a shortcut, what happened? The trip got longer. It got longer. You know, the best, the straightest line, the straight, the best way to go is obedience to the Lord. Obey the Lord. Say, Lord, keep me close to you. And for Boaz, he wasn't going to short circuit the process. Obviously, there was some chemistry here between him and Ruth. She wanted to marry him. He definitely wanted to marry her. But now he had to go through the process. He had to see, was that closest relative? And he goes, but before she leaves, he blesses her. He gives her all this provision, this blessing. And you know, just a moment, we're almost through, but I want to take a moment and comment on this. Listen, you have to receive from others. There is such a view in this world today, like if, if you receive from anyone else, it, it like devalues the, the process. That is a lie from Satan. Because what actually happens there is then you're devoid of wisdom and you can't do it. You know, it's impossible to know how to do something until you've done it. It's just impossible. And that's why in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You develop relationships with people. You build relationships. You seek out godly counsel. There's 66 books in this Bible. And one of them is devoted just to wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And you and I, we need wisdom, understanding, knowledge. We need it. You can't do this thing on your own, and God doesn't ask you to. It won't bless you. And for Ruth, you know, I think the picture of Ruth going and sitting at Boaz's feet, that was a picture of submission. But I think Ruth receiving blessing from Boaz, receiving provision from Boaz, saying to Boaz, wow, thank you. I needed this. This is a big deal. You know, that's a big picture, I think, for us with the Lord, too. Sometimes I, I, I think we go to the Lord and, you know, if we have a big request, we're willing to ask it. But if, we're, if we need something that we perceive as little, we don't even bring it to the Lord. We don't even say, Lord, I need this. Listen, your heavenly Boaz <laughs> wants to provide everything for you. A lot of times we don't have because we don't ask. We don't share our hearts with him. And I'd recommend share your heart with the Lord, ask him. Boaz blesses Ruth, she receives it, verse 16. And it says, now when she, Ruth, came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Now Ruth's kind of getting used to this. Boaz said, is that you? Now Ruth, mother-in-law, Naomi goes, is that you? Sometimes we can get thrown off. We're on the right track, but the people around us may throw us off sometimes. But it, look what he says. Then she told her all that the man had done for her. I think they had a little girl talk that night. You know what I mean? I think maybe the ice cream got taken out, and they were talking about these things. <laughs> this is exciting. You know, there was decisions, there was labor, and now there's rest. Church, that's how this thing works. Seek the Lord. Keep them at the center. Wait on the Lord. Make good decisions. Work at what God's called you to work at. And then watch what the Lord does. She told her all that the man had done for her, verse 17. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, do not go empty handed to your mother-in-law. So now Naomi's going, he's even thinking about me. This is great. I mean, this, this is a beautiful picture. God redeeming. Verse 18, then she said, this is Naomi speaking to Ruth. Naomi knows this guy has got the hots for you, man. Like, he wants to marry you. There's only one mistake you could make. And what does he say? Then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. Look at this. And if you have your pen, underline this. This is practical and this is spiritual. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. This is very cool. You know, Naomi looks on and says, all right, six ephahs of barley, this is a done deal. You know, that's like, that's like a woman who comes in, she gets the engagement ring, and it's like the size of a baseball, okay? This man wants to marry her. 
This is a real thing. But Naomi now says to Ruth, there's only one mistake you could make in this. And it's getting crazy. Boaz has some work to do to bring this home. And the only mistake you can make, Ruth, Naomi is saying, is you go out and you follow after him. And you, Boaz, do this. And you follow after him. And I've seen this so many times. You know, because you might make him go crazy. You'll probably slow down the process. And Naomi says, listen, he wants to marry you. Now let the process play out. Let him go after it and do it. Now listen, that's the practical. The spiritual is even more true, church. I think the Lord would say to you and I tonight, listen, sit still. And it's our last principle tonight, number four, if you're taking note, is wait for God's work. Wait for God's work. It's probably one of the the, the most difficult things to do in the Christian life is just to sit still and wait on the Lord, to trust him. You know, when we say trust God or walk by faith, generally we think that means we're going to go and do something for God. But the greatest exploits of faith really from the Bible consist of someone believing God and waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. If you're taking note, you can jot it down. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 through 14. This is a powerful area of scripture. Exodus 14, verse 13 through 14. This is the children of Israel. They're literally between... The, the armies of Pharaoh, of the Egypt, and the Red Sea. Moses is petrified, but he seeks the Lord. God gives him an answer. And this is what he says from the Lord to the people. And Moses said to the people, Exodus 14, verse 13, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more forever. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Isn't that powerful? Naomi said to Ruth, sit still. Moses says to the children of Israel, stand still. So we need to sit still. We also need to stand still. You need to stand still. You need to wait on the Lord. You know, I know this is something I'm not very good at, but I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm growing in it. You know, circumstances where it seems like there's no escape. In the physical things, it looks like they're disintegrating. You know, sometimes you may be in a position, you think, wow, life looks like it's falling apart. And the Lord would say, listen, stand still. Sit still. I'm working. I'm working. The psalmist, Psalm 46, verse 10 So he said, stand still, sit still. Psalm 46, verse 10, he said, be still. Can you guys say be still? Be still. still. I can do this a little better. The not moving part is tough for me. The be still and know that I am God. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In the Hebrew, literally, when you study Psalm 46, verse 10 in the Hebrew, it literally means hands off. Hands off and know that I am God. Now it gets a little more difficult, doesn't it? It's like, Lord, I'm totally letting you do it, right? God, I'm going to totally leave this in your hands. God's going, come on. What are you talking about? Church, when you get involved in it and you try to make it happen, all you do is slow down the process. Understand this. God is the initiator. We respond to him. And maybe tonight as circumstances has evolved around your life, you feel like there's something you need to do. Something you need to do. But the Holy Spirit, through his word, is saying, be still. Be still. That last verse, Naomi said it to Ruth. And I think God would say this to you tonight. The man will not rest until he's accomplished all of it. Guys, listen. The work that God began in your life God will not rest until it's accomplished. God will not rest till it's accomplished. <laughs> if there's a sin you're still struggling with, God's not going to rest till it's, you're free from it. If it's a, whatever it might be, all the way till getting you from this side of heaven into his kingdom, God will not rest 
until it is accomplished. And I'll close with this verse. If you're taking note, jot this down. Please read it later. Zephaniah, probably not a book you read often, but Zephaniah, there's a Zechariah, so don't forget the PH. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And I want to say something right now. Listen, Jesus is at rest in heaven, but he has not rested in his love yet. He will not rest in his love until he gets his kids from this to that. That's when he'll rest in his love, when you are with him, when you and I are home in heaven with him. And he's working right now. Listen, he's working. You may think sometimes, God, where are you? What are you doing? I believe at those moments when we feel like, God, where are you? What are you doing? He's so deep under the hood of our life, we don't even know he's there. He's in places deep within us we don't even know exist. And what is he doing? He's loving you. He's not resting in his love, but he's working. He's changing you. And I think for many of us tonight, we need to hear that. Be still. Stand still. Let the Lord do it. Hands off and know that he is God. Hands off, right? Hands off. Keep your hands off. Let the Lord keep doing it. Whether it has to do with your marriage, child raising, right? Ministering the gospel to a family member, a coworker. Listen, we can speak the truth in love, but hands off. Leave room for the Holy Spirit to do what he does best. Change people. Work. Open eyes. Open hearts. Right? The most powerful thing you could do is get on your knees and pray. Say, Lord, work in their life. Work, Lord. Work. Touch them. Bless them. Give them new life in Christ. You'll be shocked. I'm telling you, you'll be shocked what the Lord will do. So I pray the Lord will give you great rest. Um, we'll look at uh, Ruth chapter 4 next week and read ahead, get into it, enjoy that book. We're going to wrap up the book of Ruth next week, but rest in the Lord. Be still. Keep your hands off. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's talking to you about specifically, but I'm sure it's something. Let Him keep working.